Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Jade. Welcome to Team Engineered Podcast, where we talk everything teams, getting the most out of your team or your business. And it is a wonderful afternoon here, apart from lockdown. So it's rather topical as we talk about teams and how we spread them around the place here. I'm based in Newcastle, so we've only just got into lockdown. We are just on 22 hours into our lockdown. And oh. Jade is still free, I believe, Jade. Yes, I am free. We're lucky at Lennox Head that, uh, yeah, we're, we're still allowed to roam free. Um, we've got to wear those little face covery things. But other than that, we're, we're, we're pretty blessed. Yep. I think and I've managed to, I've managed to avoid the hard lockdowns. I think this whole crazy situation. You kind of dodged them all over the place. I just keep you? dodging them. Yeah, it's not my reality. I'm like, no, not my reality. Yeah. So we, we've been relatively lucky and um, unfortunately there's a whole heap of stuff going on this week in Newcastle and here we are. I guess, you know, for, for me and my team, we're, we're pretty lucky where, you know, we, we've already been working in this sort of semi-remote kind of, you know, let's let's not be around if we don't have to be. And, um, you know, they're getting along pretty well and they're getting stuff done and, it's um you know for the for the hard lockdown it was all like oh well we just we keep doing what we were doing and um the good thing is is that for our students um in our courses we can still bring them in to do the the training mm. that we can't do remotely so um a little more restrictions on it we'll reduce the sizes and everything else like that but we can certainly still service our students which yeah that's um it's it's terrible for a student to think that Oh, I'm in the middle of my course and now I can't do my course and I've spent all this money. So it's um, you know, we're we're feeling pretty happy that we can still look after those people. Well, what I love is one of the team, Amy, she coined the phrase upskill in your downtime. And so that's been a big thing. We did a bit of a push out to to the students and say, like, you can still upskill in your downtime. And everyone's like, oh, that's great. It'll stop me from going crazy. But also reaching out to the employers that especially in the APT team's line of work and the, the teams that were training, like being on site at uh, mine sites or other sort of facilities where they've got guys that usually fly in, fly out, or they're normally on site and they're just sitting at home twiddling their thumbs, they are actually able to get started in some of the online and blended stuff. And if they're local to, to the team, can come in. And I must say yesterday I was – really stoked you weren't on our team call yesterday uh Kyle but the boys were really like okay cool like even if it's not as profitable as what it would normally be by you know having six or eight students in um and doing it I'm more than happy to come in if that helps other people's mental health and like keeps them going and even if we can only do one student at a time as long as it's enough to you know pay the bills like I'm happy to do it I'm happy to do it I was like that is such an amazing attitude from the guys and they're also looking at okay what else needs to be done around the workplace oh well the training room could get an upgrade or like the, everyone's like okay this this sucks and I think when we've been through some of the lockdowns before and had this stuff it's kind of been maybe a little bit more uh, I don't want to say victim mentality but more if we look at the the the, the victim passenger th driver th um, thriver they sufferer. were a little sufferer they were Michelle. Michelle will Michelle. be smacking us if we don't use the right she's, words. Suffering. I know she, and she's usually. I haven't got the. I haven't got the chat open. She's usually on as well. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm very sorry, Michelle. But the, the instead of going into, ugh, like this again or this is going to suck. It was like, okay, well, what else can we do? How else can we help each other? What could we do in the downtime? And I think that's been a real shift. And can I tell you, I haven't shared this, but it's topical to why we chose this topic today. I think one of the big shifts for them was a decision that you made about a client last week. <laughs> it probably was a little bit. And mm. um, the, look, the, I've, I've got a really great team of, of boys and girls and, um, yeah, they do work hard and, and all credit to them. They They've um, they've carried me for the last few weeks while I've been dealing with other stuff and um, yeah they were they were I guess they were a little bit um, dubious about sort of 
coming in and, and sort of saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, this this customer is giving us all this grief," and um, you know, I, I sort of I dug to the bottom of it and I went, "Well, they can rack off." Yeah, like I think being unreasonable. you use a different four-letter word, but you had I a K did. in it. I did. I had um, a C and a K. <laughs> <laughs> and and like it's the the customer and and understandably the the customer was under a lot of pressure and and all of those sorts of things but my team were working really hard to get the job done for them in really trying conditions and um yeah they were they were being given really probably quite unfair sort of comments and everything else so you know I, I had to you know pull the customer aside and and I just said oh look honestly it's just not acceptable you like you know, I understand you're under pressure and I understand that things aren't going well and you're feeling frustrated, but look, you, you just can't treat my team this way. It's just not on. Yeah, and I honestly, the the respect that the team have for you from that, because I think, you know, a lot of the times, especially when it's situations like this, it's going to be businesses can kind of go, oh, you know, we just have to take any work and put up with any shit because you just got to get the dollars in the door because you never know what's coming around the corner and that mentality of know that you know what the team comes first and my people come first even if they are a, a big client and just putting their for some of them it was like their mental health really um to to the forefront that just it, i want to say brownie points but it just made them just reminded them how much you do care and what is important to the business and that's i can the shift was almost instantaneous like the that the shift to oh what else can we do for the business like the business has our back let's have the businesses back and let's see what else we can do because they're willing to even walk away from uh, a big client because it doesn't it's not for our best interests. Look, it's it's a hard thing as a business owner to sort of go I'm I'm going to give this customer and push back at them when you know i need the work and and we need the dollars coming in the door and covid's locking us down all those sorts of things but the, the problem is is that you know the my, my team genuinely work hard they they put a lot of effort in they care about you know not only the work that we do internally but the work that we do for our customers and they actually care that it it, it all comes together well so for the customers to sort of be completely unreasonable with them and and like all but nasty Mm. You, you've just got to back the team. You know, it's, yeah, the, the team knows that at times they're gonna they're gonna do the wrong thing, and there's gonna be some harsh words thrown at them, and they're gonna deserve it. But you know, conversely, they should know that when they're putting their best effort in, that we should back them. Yeah, hundred percent. It's just it's all too common that we see that business business owners, business leaders say, you know, the customer is always right. And everything is about the customer's right and the, you know, yeah, the customer might be right. But if you always put your customer before your team, then you can never expect to the team to put your company before anything else. And you you can't expect them to operate with that level of care if you're always saying that external parties to us are more important. And look, that, that saying is 100% true, but there's a bit missing off the back of it. The customer is always right, except for when they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and like I say, like the the team are genuinely putting the best effort in. So it, it wasn't like they were off, they were goofing off, and and you know not putting the effort in and, and all of that. They, they, they were genuinely busting themselves to try and get this project done. You know, not not due to their fault, not due to our customers' fault, but there was all this pressure on the job finishing. Mm. And so the, they just they stepped up to it and went for it, but unfortunately, our customer, being under the most amount of pressure, probably didn't realise that um, they needed to support everyone around them. And sort of, I guess they took the the very typical, um, you know, I, my suppliers will do as I say, and I'll treat them how I treat yeah. them kind of attitude. And um, you know, for for me, I, I I prefer to think of everyone in my you know all of my stakeholders to be partners. You know, if if my suppliers are doing a good job for me, you know, we should be looking after them. We should be doing everything we can. Mm. If my customers are doing the right thing for me, we should be looking after them. You know, if 
um, you know, if I'm if I'm involved with a regulatory body, you know, they're a partner in my business. I need them to be a part of my business. Um, and you know, equally, and and it can be scary. Sometimes you've got to bash the regulators around too. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think with uh, if I looked at some of the issues that came from that customer, it, it maybe it was that waterfall of shit, right? They they're obviously feeling the pressure, and he may not have. They may not have even intended to come across the way they did, but the way they were communicating, and we've had multiple podcasts about the communication styles, but that would have continued if if they weren't brought up. And I just see too many times that people just cop it or the business stands for it and the team feel the pressure until they, they feel like they're not seen, heard, appreciated and it's the straw that breaks the camel's back and they're gone when all of it could have been fixed just by having that conversation clearly and more transparency. Transparency? 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 We've, we've, <laughs> we've talked about it a few times, though, where, you know, as, as that team leader, now whether you're a business owner and looking after your business team or whether you're running a team somewhere and you're that team leader, so to speak, and, you know, you're, you're the one that's got to sort of, um, yeah, you, you don't have to necessarily cop all the crap, but you've got to sort of mm. shield your team away from the things that are a hurdle to them, you know, and a difficult customer to, uh, you know, a bunch of tradies that are just trying to get a job done doesn't help them get their job done. It's just it's just a hurdle. So, mm. you know, your job as the team leader is to clear that hurdle, get it passed so that they can just do their best work, do the things that they're genius at. Um, and I think, yeah. you know, we've just got to remember that as that team leader, wear the shield, so to speak. Yeah, beautiful. There's there's another layer of this for me uh, when we're talking on the topic of you know, tell, telling a client to run along. Um, I look at it also from the perspective of like what's a profit-killing client? So my favourite profit-killing client to tell to F off, which is fire, was Google. Like I worked so hard to win them, like so hard, uh, years and years just to have the ego name to say that, you know, I recruit for Google. and But the process and the rigmarole and, you know, when you're a recruiter, you only get paid a, a, under those terms with Google, like they don't retain you, um, on result. But there is absolutely no way to get someone through an interview process quicker than three months. And then you get someone halfway through process and then they go, oh, they didn't go to one of the approved schools. I'm like, well, firstly, why don't we pick that up at the beginning and can you tell me the approved school so I don't waste anybody's time and they're like oh no we can't we can't do that and it's like that's where you go go f yourself like that that's wasted not only my time the team's time the poor candidate's time obviously their own internal time that's just a profit killer like all the way around for everybody and it's just frustrating as hell so it's like, and my team would be like, are you kidding me? We've just worked and, like, put together all these people and, like, not got commission on other things, not got other deals because I've dedicated all this time to it, to have it pulled out from underneath me. Like, the motivation level, like, you go to work on something else like that and they're like, they're not really inspired. So, it's again, it's putting up that hurdle. It's, it's putting up a barrier to motivation. And the people want to see that they're contributing and they're making progress. So, when... If they're just constantly hitting, and this is like the profit killers, like if it, if it's not progressing and it's chewing up too much time and it's not productive, then it's it's making the team feel out of flow, and then they're just gonna resent working on the project because if you're not just getting those dopamine yeah. hits of ticking it off, right? Yep, yep, yeah, and you know I've I've had other customers, you know, and. With best intentions, you take them on and best intentions to do a good job and, and solve the problems for them. But it really seems like some people just don't want their problem solved. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the, um, I say, like the hospitality people that don't come past your table to top up your wine or ask if you want more. It's like, are you allergic to money? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Are you allergic to winning? Because... It seems like you're just doing everything to fuck this process up. <laughs> is, is that a good indication, though, that the, the leader of the team there has let their, their team down by tolerating the bad 
bad customers, which means that they just don't bother. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Sorry. <laughs> <'Cause> it, <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, it seems like when people go out and, and are paying for a, a meal, um, it seems like it brings out the rudeness in people. Yeah. Wow. How many times have you seen that? Oh, I, mean, I think that's a, I can times. tell you the mark of say the mark of a man, like when you <laughs> or or or, or a man um, in those situations though. But oh, my favorite on that on that line of topic though, what I would what I used to do um, when I first was building my own recruitment team. When I had candidates coming in to, to meet with me to interview for our team, I'd go and sit at re before everyone stalked you on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd go and sit at reception and just see how they treated the f the first line of defence. Like, how did they treat the the admin or receptionist when they came in? Told me a great deal about their character and how that and if they're that was rude to me. I was like, oh, it's such a it's such a great look on their face when they're like, oh, I'm here to see Jade. And I just stand up and go, yes, nice to meet you. This is going to be fast. <laughs> Hope you didn't pay yeah, for long parking. <laughs> that builds for your team, though, doesn't it? That, you know, you're happy to sit there and screen mm -hmm. idiots and tell them to rack off. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, um, that, and yeah, people at dinner. Oh, man. I've literally, Actually, I don't know if I told you the story. Uh, I was out with a group of uh, people that we used to uh, do the entourage with, used to uh, do our entrepreneurial course with, and I went to, it was after that, but it was um, another event. We all went to dinner, and I was so disgusted with the way that they were speaking to the wait staff that I just up and left. I was. I had another friend with me, and we just both was like, oh, Actually, it was Andrew. It was just like this is just despicable. He was the like, nice guy, not the rude one. He was a nice guy. Yeah, it was just absolutely despicable. And I tell you what, on this topic, I wish I would have told those guys to go fuck themselves that night. Like it was pretty obvious that we were like, "You guys are dicks." Yeah. But I didn't actually, and I just didn't go. I just didn't associate with them anymore i never actually went back and said do you know what that's just not okay behavior mm -hmm. like where just because some of them had just come into money or uh some of um their parents were quite wealthy and they were running the business for them so they felt like they were some sort of god and i don't know like I don't think the wait staff would have got to the point. Well, actually, whatever might have um, told them to fuck off. But it's when we when we tolerate behaviour, like silence is permission. Inaction is still action. Yeah. And I think that that's probably, there's probably many occasions that we've, we could go back and like, either if you look over um, the work that you've done with your team, and the situations that the teams had, say, the, in the last quarter, where you could go, actually, in action, like I should have told someone to either go fuck themselves or, like, just, uh, like, pull them up on a behaviour or something because they're not going to learn. And like I said, with your with your client, like, they may not have realised just because they've got, you know, they've got the whole lot of shit piling on, they're, they're just blasting it out. And been able to correct, but how many times have we seen that other behaviour by other people, or by allowing it, it allows it to scale? So, oh, well, their their last supplier let them do that, or their last manager let them do that, or the last team member did it. So it just it just keeps going and going and going. Um, and I think that there's plenty of opportunity that we should go. Got to have these more transparent conversations for the good of humanity. It truly surprises me how some people just seem to to elevate themselves in an organisation or a group, and and it seems to be purely on that um, brashness or that real abrasive 
you know, I'm, I'm just going to ride everyone. I'm just going to give everyone a hard time. And I can remember, um, geez, it would have been nearly 15 years ago now. So I was significantly younger and <laughs> nowhere near as good looking though. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. so I was probably quite a lot, uh, a lot more hot headed, but I was running a team and um, it was when the Sydney desalination plant was being built. And there was a there was a big rig up here in Newcastle and we were having we it had been brought in um, and it was supposed to be fitted out to do a job. And as they've started the testing, they've worked out that the it's just not suitable and it's broken and there's all these problems with it. And, in, you know, it, it was like a four month delay on the on the project so yeah everyone's freaking out and you know we, we start off with with a relatively low level sort of team leader project manager and it, you know it elevates and it elevates and it elevates and then you know all of a sudden we've got a director from the project who's in and he's riding everyone and um you know i'm, I'm running a small team we i think we had a team of about five or six um very very highly skilled highly technical um people finishing off some jobs project plan in place you know he agreed on he's how we're going to do it you know and so yeah every day we're I'm dragged off the job you know tell us where we're up to the the whole um you know what's going on thing and um yeah every day oh it's not going fast enough but we're on we're on schedule like we've, we've agreed on the schedule we're, we're on schedule oh are you sure we're not ahead well, we might be, but what I'm going to tell you is we're on schedule. <laughs> Are we going to finish early? No. And the, the reason that I had to keep saying those things and be the front to keep bringing that stuff back, though, is that while my team was actually ahead and they were flying along, they were having a great time, the minute that we'd said we're two days ahead mm. was the minute that they'd have been under more pressure to be another two days ahead. And then, yeah, that's that's not fair on them. And I know, like, you know, we're, we're talking about this really high level dude that's, you know, he's the director of the project and you know, he, he runs all these high level stuff. And I can remember one day, probably about two thirds of the way through the, the project. So it was a 10 day project for us. And, um, you know, he, he's, oh, it's just not quick enough. It's just not good enough. And I just turned to him and I went, well, look, honestly, the best thing you can do is drill a couple of holes in this thing and take it out to sea and sink it. <laughs> you could have heard a pin drop in the room after that. Everyone in the room just went dead silent. They were scared. They didn't know what was going to come out of it. And, you know, I just sat there. I just said, like, we're on schedule. This is what we agreed to. So I'm sorry it doesn't fit. But honestly, if this isn't good enough, take her out to sea, sink it, start again. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> The funny thing is, is that 15 minutes later, he comes up to me outside and he says, there's no hard feelings, you know. I went, no, I'm, this isn't a personal thing. I'm fine. I said, but yeah, you, you have to understand that I'm looking after my team. They're, they're doing a great job at the moment. Just let them do their job. It's, but again, this is so many people and so many leaders, they don't know how to have that conversation. What... So sometimes they will tell them, like they wait, they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait and they wait until the straw breaks the camel's back and they're literally like, <laughs> go F yourself. Like that's it, and we're that's done. It. That was the point and that I does break it. it. Yeah, and it, and it does, like if you aren't able to manage that, then it, does, it, it can break the relationship. Whereas if you can learn to have these conversations in advance, then it only serves everybody. And if not, they're a true dickhead and they can just fuck right off definitely and and hold that and be be confident enough to hold that that thought process i guess yeah yeah so like when we when we put together the thinking about doing this podcast we we're like okay the the sentiment of go f yourself or um like that those boundary settings it does seem a lot easier like in personal situations you're like you you either you feel more confident in yourself to be able to do that because it's the consequences is around you is you or you know the the boundaries around it where it's a you i think people feel it's a little bit more um gray area or sticky when you're taking that over to teams or the um 
you know, putting the company on the line. What do you what do you think's a good way for people to avoid getting to the F right off stage? In a in a team situation, in a in a company situation. So I I know from from a company situation or a company point of view with it with my team, the easiest way and the best way is to run it through the filter of the virtues. You know, does this align with my virtues? So you know, in in the case of um, you know my team under pressure, the first question is, are they being awesome? And they were. They were they were being awesome. They were putting in their best efforts. They were doing the best job they could. So then the next question is: Is this situation human centric? And it's not. So therefore, it doesn't fit with my business. So we need we need to set that line, and we need to actually deal with it there and then. So I think if we're open and forward with our virtues, and we know, and we you know we broadcast that, we live it, we demonstrate it, and we share it. I think that starts the process of setting the boundaries. Oh, I love that you brought that up because the if the people, if your team doesn't have the painted picture of what success looks like to live the virtues and you haven't done the how do these virtues roll internally, externally and in our orbit, which with your team is like, okay, so what, you know, what being human-centric means with dealing with customers and customers dealing with us is this. And what it isn't is this. And what it means to be awesome with our team is this or not this. Like there's there was a there's some really robust conversations around that. And the most important thing is though, is that you actually do live and breathe it. Because we talked about the the culture and what destroys culture um, previously. And that's like when we have words on a wall and awesome marketing words on a wall. And then there's a disconnect and it's like, oh, yeah, well, internally we operate um, with integrity and honesty and we have, to, we have to do that with each other. But just go and tell the client this white lie or... They can do whatever <laughs> they want or to. Just, open up, just pick up this rug and sweep it underneath there <laughs> and that, that destroys the virtue of, say, honesty or trust. But also, yeah, if, and if we have these human centric and this is we're not getting treated like good humans and we oh no but they're a big paying customer we let you know gotta gotta like appease them then again it starts to like when you've got those uh you say you want to live that way if you are breaking it in any chain of your um business in terms of partner supplier team member anything then that's going to destroy the integrity of living those virtues Carl, I have to share, I'm, I'm having a giggle because um, <clears throat> one of my new clients, they're awesome, Super Butcher, they've been rewriting their ads and they said they saw us online and he's just sent me a screenshot. We've just, uh, we've just implemented our new ad writing strategy. We are only accepting the best attitude in brackets. Strictly no dickhead policy. <laughs> he's like, oh. I'm like, this is so good. And for them that like they really they they know what that means for them as well and they're building this amazing culture um and it again it's like how do you integrate it what is what's you know we don't want any dickheads on our team so are we going to tolerate that from our suppliers and how does that end like what about with customers what do we do with the customers like do you you don't want oh, if you've ever worked in retail and you've had Ooh. someone that they they want to be a loyal customer, I think, just to make your life hell. Actually, if you've ever worked in hospitality, definitely. Like that, uh, what do you do definitely. in that situation, right? I think that just, I think that the only way forward in that is because it if you say have a customer that constantly comes in just causing a rub, right? Causing a rub with the team, with the staff. That and then usually it's the customers around you as well, uh, around around them. Like it's just anxiety producing, it's anger producing. That the vibration that happens after that interaction, it I think it'd be much better for needs to be a thought out process for the team leader for the business owner to actually pull that customer up one day and just say, do you know what? Not acceptable behavior. If you want it, 
keep coming back here, you need to. Stop slapping the girls on the ass. Yeah. Or <laughs> start slapping the girls on no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, But it's a classic example, though, isn't it? You know, like, um, you know, the pub or the club or the whatever, mm. and, you know, the, the guys that think it's okay to slap the girls or, you know, whistle at them or whatever it is. You know, yeah. You, you just say no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if you run a building site, like, you know, you're on display. Don't let your team do that to people around mm. you. Yeah. Oh, walking. Take you've it's a, an ultimate experience for a woman being a promotional girl working for a liquor company and having to walk past a construction site in Darwin. Yeah. You you you've got to be able to turn and. Give a little back. <laughs> and then it just becomes sport, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Then, it, then it's just sport. Um, so we we should we should head back to the boundaries thing and, and I thought talk you a were little bit about. We should head boundaries. for our beer. And I'm like, yeah, we should well, head for that, our beer. That's a good plan. We should we should cheers on the beer. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta get my. Yours is open. Steve, I haven't had have mine open. Take his, his mobility <laughs> scooter <laughs> down the road to get your beer. <laughs> Oh, you did. Cheers me now. Cheers. <laughs> uh, yes, he loads up the electric. He takes him through the drive-through. That's nice. I like it. I like it. That's that's uh, been good. It's. Uh, I'm very grateful. He came back to make sure that I was fed and hydrated because he goes. He goes. If I was like, just go and enjoy the beach. Like you work so hard to build all of this. This week with your one on your knee one scooter man. with your broken ankle to turn this this was just all white walls and delicious white i don't know if it was just mdf skirt like architrave skirt and actually i go back to the view um but he made all of this happen with his broken foot and i'm like you need to take the day off go to the pub it's friday afternoon and he came back to bring beer so that i wasn't beerless when it came to you i, and I would me. go to the pub but we're not allowed to Mm. Oh, sorry about that. Just rubbed that right in there, didn't I? <laughs> so now that we have our beer, the boundaries thing. So the the first, I think, um, you know, even in your own team, as a team, like if you run a team of tradies or a team of retail staff or whatever it is, even if your business doesn't have virtues, you should be looking at, you know, here's what we should be striving to. Here's, here's our our benchmarks and our virtues that we want to try and achieve and then everything radiates from it so we can use that as that that filter so to speak about um you know does does this situation fit our virtues does you know if i if i tried to sift it through here is it going to fit or is it going to get held up on one of those virtues and we need to change something about the situation i think it's probably important as well to and you know we hinted on this but a little bit before is to back the team you know make sure the team actually understands that while they're doing the right thing and doing the best work they can and you know achieving their best and being awesome in my case you know that you've got their back you you know it doesn't matter if they stuff it up it doesn't matter if something goes wrong it doesn't matter if they're sick and they've got to have a day off or whatever it is you know that no matter what we've got their back because they're out there being awesome, they're doing their best work, and that's what we want from our team. Yeah, and, like, it just goes general rule for life, right? If someone knows you've got their back, they're going to have, they're going to feel safe and secure and have your back. And the there's, in a business, I, and in your team, I don't think that there's anything more, anything more important than the humans you have in the business. Unless you're literally a one-man band, that's made some epic tech and managed to scale the shit out of it. Amazing. But businesses are built on the people and like they call it human capital for a reason, right? Like it's, it is your, your most valuable asset and it can be your biggest down to, downfall. And there's always a domino effect. Like if you, if you've got a, a team and like a really good person leaves because they've been, really aggrieved or something's happened and they feel really done wrong by and it's a mark of say a leader 
not living the virtues or completely breaching what was the code like like virtues are a code of conduct like and if the business breaches that code of conduct to a piece a customer or somebody else then that just that sends such a lasting message to the team and the dominoes will fall they will roll right out the door so it's so important that you are putting your people first and thinking about because when you do they they just they give back to you endlessly and and it's just good humaning so I had a really interesting conversation with one of my team yesterday, I think it was. And um, he'd come to me and he, he's gone, oh, I, I need this reference written. And I sort of went, oh, yeah, sure, okay, um, give me a bit more info. What's what's it all about? And he went, oh, it's from a, a training upgrade and, you know, I, I need that. I went, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's easy, a piece of cake. He went, oh, I should have said it was a reference for a job. <laughs> and, now, this is where the, and I hope that I actually built some some rapport here. Um, the response that I gave him was, you do understand I'd do that for you. Yeah, that's that's probably quite a scary thing for most people to sort of go, what? You, you would do that? And even he looked a little shocked at, oh, really? It's like, yeah. If, if that serves you, if that's where you are in the world, then fine, no problems. Yeah. I can do that. That's not a problem at all. So it's again about saying to them, "I've got your back." You know, yeah. like it doesn't. You, you don't have to be my servant forever, and yeah. you know, I don't own you. We we don't buy our slaves anymore. Yeah, people before profits. <laughs> so you know, why not back them? Why yeah. not back? Why and not high five them when they're doing something good? It's funny. I literally just came off of doing a speaking gig just before this call, and was talking, teaching them how to like how to do headhunting. So it was a group um, of practice owners in Allied Health, and like how how do they headhunt and how do they use LinkedIn and building networks and things like that. And they're like, oh well, I'm scared to connect with other. Um, principals or directors of practices because what if they try to steal my people or like what if they look at my network and I said well I've always come from this mindset that if anyone on my team isn't absolutely stoked to turn up for work every day well not every day but 90% of the time and the day the good days far outweigh the stress anxiety depression days or the pissed off days then I don't deserve to keep them and it's not someone stolen them from me it's i've dropped the ball and and put them on like it's like i've i've put them on the open market so i always come from a from a point of view of i look i used to say to my team if, if someone headhunts you go do the interview i just i know that where we stand especially in the market and it's only going to make us look better when you realize the grass isn't greener so not only that, like if, if your team, your team grows and if you're a good team leader, if you're a good business owner, you should be growing your team. They should be, they should be flourishing and they should be, you know, learning and growing and all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, what that does is that might actually incite a change of, of where I want to be. You know, I, I, mm. I, I realize I don't want to be a tradie anymore or I want to do something else. So, you know, you've you've grown them, you you've you've put this effort into them and they've they've grown and they haven't quite grown into exactly what you're expecting. But why throw all that away? Like mm. why not give yourself a pat on the back and go, well, shit, look at look at how good a job I did. And you know, okay, what how can I help? How can I help you find what's gonna serve you and, and make you feel um, you know, enlightened every day that you turn up, even if that's not here yeah well again i was just from the conversation i was having this morning i was saying to them that it's the what we talk about with tours of duty being okay like this is not the industrial age where someone signs up and does their apprenticeship when they're 16 and they're they die at their machine 
um, and they, they never go anywhere. It's if we look at the LinkedIn way of doing things, the tours of duty and being OK, that someone might only be there for a certain period of time to get a certain job done. And as if you can help them, like that's part of that alliance, that that agreement, like you come and give me your best work and I'm going to give you the best of me and help you get where you want to go and know that hopefully your business evolves and, and they can move into another role within you with you or another interest or something else. But it's it's okay and it's not personal if there is that shift or that career progression is not available at the time because the people that have worked for you before are the best people to refer to you in the future. Absolutely. So you were talking about, you know, connecting with other people in your network that are a similar role and they're going to headhunt by people and all this sort of stuff. One of my team I actually got from a peer who referred this person on to me. So, um, you know, I, I was, oh, geez, I was at a mining expo and um, bumped into him and we'd been looking for another trainer and, you know, it had been quite a, quite a, we need a very special person, so it's not an easy thing to fill that role mm. and we just got to be patient. Ran into this peer of mine, a friend of mine, having a chat and he went, you know, how's the world going? What's going on? And I went, oh, actually, you might be able to help me, you know, like, I'm looking for another trainer, you know, so, or someone that's interested in being a trainer and, you know, this is the kind of person I'm, I'm looking for. And he went, oh, yeah, I, I know someone like that. I actually know someone that would be perfect for that. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, right. Eh? All right, well, you know, can you, can you get him to give me a buzz and we'll have a yak and all of that? Turned out he worked for it. So, yeah. you know, it, it wasn't that he was referring a friend or someone like that. It was one of his underlings, was, mm -hmm. yeah, one of his team, that he went, well, actually, where you are now is not what's going to serve you, and here's an awesome opportunity for you mm -hmm. to go on and be something else. Yeah. So by building that peer network with, you know, similar people, similar businesses, you know, we can find those people that are looking for a change, and I've referred people on. You know, I, I've lost count of the number of times where me and someone else's boss has plotted out their future while they're applying for the job. <laughs> <laughs> and like we, I did it um, quite some time ago. I, I, um, I was talking one of my customers at the time. He was looking at employing one of the, one of the, one of these one of my friends, I guess, and um, he went, oh. You know, I, I'm sort of, I'm probably three, maybe six months away before I'm ready for him, but he needs some work. And I sort of went, well, geez, I've got, I've got probably three, maybe six months worth of work. So, yeah, how about, how about we do this? He can come and work for me. He can, he can come and get this project done for me. When he's finished that project, you can pick him up and run with it. And yeah, you know, we'll look after each other. Worked. It's perfect. He's still perfect. in that job. He's still working that job now. And I've still got that relationship with that customer yeah. because we were brave enough to talk to each other and go, well, how can we, how can we make this work? I love that. It is hilarious because literally just before the call, I was saying to you, I need to get some stuff sorted. We we're talking about the, the new office space and this is the temporary, what we build upstairs. And I'm like, I need to have space because I really want to have like a trainee or an apprentice um, to come and work with me. And he's like, yeah, you need a mini you. I'm like, yeah, I need mini me. He's like, you need K just here. And I'm like, oh, what I'd give for K just here. Uh, he's like, but what you need is someone with zero ambition, like someone that's really fucking good at their job and no ambition so they never leave you. I went, no, that is not what I want. <laughs> I, he's like, what do you mean? He goes, but, like, imagine how long it will take someone to be mini you. And I'm like, well, I think Charlotte's kind of mini me. Um, <laughs> mini big me. Um, mini mini so, me <laughs> the world way <laughs> um but he, he was like really perplexed and i was like no like i would absolutely love it if i got to work with someone and help them really learn about ev like anything that's my genius that they think they can use and then i would just like if they want to move on and start their own business i just fund their business and then like then they can have their business that's still our business and then i can help them and like the rest of my team, like they go out on their own and then they just contract back and then we're all winning. <laughs> and 
he's like, I remember. Ah. <laughs> I remember when I was early 20s and um, I took a bit of a career change and I was teaching people to fly and I was flying and doing all these sorts of things. So well away from being a tradie. And the guy that I was I was working with at the time was super experienced. And, um, you know, I, I know he taught me to fly. So I was totally in awe of, you know, how good a job he did of flying, but also teaching and all that sort of stuff. And not long after I started with him, I remember him saying to me, there's absolutely no reason in the world why you can't be better than me. And it's like, I, I can remember at the time, nah, Nah, that's, Hire people that's, better than you and then get out of their way. <laughs> that's that's crazy talk, you know. Like, what, what are you on about? Like, you taught me. How how the hell am I going to do this better than you? But it's so true. You know, it's so yeah. true that there, there was every opportunity for me to do a better job than him and be able to fly better and be able to teach better and, you know, implement better things. And as you say, he just had to get out of my way. And it's a it's a line that I actually use with my team quite often where, you know, they'll be talking about, geez, you're so comfortable in the training room or, you know, you delivered that so well and all of that. And, you know, my, my standard response is, do you know what the difference is? And they always go, oh, you just, you know, you're a natural at it. You're a star. Mm, there's, there's 20 years of it. Yeah, I've done it for 20 years and there's no reason why you can't learn and do it better than me because you've got the benefit of my experience first. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the things about propping your team up and standing them up so that, mm. you know, there's no reason in the world that they can't be better than you and there's no reason in the world that they shouldn't be better than you. And like you say, why wouldn't you want to high-five that? Yeah. And just the thing is, if if you if everyone works at the their best of their ability for even a short version of like length of time, it's so much better than having someone for years and years that works at half their capacity and worse, half their happiness. Or less. Or less. It's like, yeah. and this is, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, it's probably something that we should talk about that just because someone wants to stay and do that job doesn't, doesn't mean that they're doing a bad job either. Yeah. So, you know, ev everyone's different, and you just made reference to the star profile. <laughs> and, you know, the, the star likes to be the star of the show and shine and, you know, be the front and make all the noise and all of those sorts of things. Um, and Do you know any stars around here? <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that our employee that's quite happy to knuckle down, do the do the hard yards, plot along, and actually be that stable force in the business. It doesn't mean that they're doing the wrong thing, and it doesn't mean that they're stagnant or anything else like that. Um, it just means that that's not them to be the star. Yeah, but the, we talked about. I think we, did we talk about this in the podcast the other day? But we, if we had a business full of us, it all turned to shit. Um. Very quickly. <laughs> Like you need those those balancing profiles. It's more about if um, if they're not in flow or not happy and not working to their capacity of Definitely. what level Definitely. they can be at. But I'm going to use that as a pivot point of when should we tell a team member to fuck off? Because, Ooh. oh, I know. Um, I was just having a conversation in some, like one of my coaching groups and Someone had an example. So I get I get asked a lot of advice to, you know, the recruitment advice. And so I was like, oh, I've got this person. Who's their team? And then this happened. And then I'm like, oh, shit. And the example is number one salesperson. It's always, it's always the way, right? Number one salesperson with a giant ego. And they get away with, like, non-conformance, not showing up, like, talking down towards other team members and that because they feel like, you know, they feel superior. And usually in this instance, they get, there's so many other people along the process that touch a deal to get it done, but they're the only one that gets a commission. Yep. 
So, so there's like, there's been a, the advertising and marketing team that's brought in the leads. Like there's been a copywriter and a videographer and there's this person. Then there's been the team that's picked up the lead and to handle it. And then it's booked it in and then it goes through to here. And then the salesperson gets a sale, but then it's a short term sale. And then they go through a program and they need to be retained. And there's like a whole community management team that keeps them happy, a whole group of trainers that are training them throughout that process as well and coaching them throughout the process and then they get retained and the salesperson who takes it, makes the call again and who made the original call gets the commission and none of those other people get any recognition for it so they strutting around like the fucking king shit right and yeah they're bringing in they're bringing in the lion's share of the sales when we've dug a bit, a little bit deeper on this one is they're stealing the majority of the leads. So that's the first problem. The other people aren't even getting a chance. Well, and they're kind of bullying, they're kind of bullying the other people out of their out of their leads. So it's not really obvious either. Um, and it's just, you know, you've got people in tears, you've got people stressed out, you've got people that are not feeling recognized. It's but they've been with them the longest and they make the most, they make the most money. What's your opinion? It, it happens so often and um to to digress just a little bit it reminds me of when i bought a car a little while ago and um i'd had that's a 120b a, a what sorry a datsun 120b no no um it was a <laughs> ford xr6 oh. So, oh what were you thinking and turbo I'd, um, I'd actually been out on a job all day i'd had a you know i was i'd had a pretty hectic day and um, still in my high vis uniform, I, I was probably had black stuff on my face, and I was yeah, you could see I'd had a, a bit of a hard day. And I walked into the car yard, or oh, would have been ten to five, so right on close time. And I've wandered around for like five minutes, and the the guru salesman all turned their back on me. Yeah, you know, they they and you could see like you could see the the puffed up chest and the ah oh, this. Waste of a time, you know. You can you can so smell the cologne those... from the other side of the yard, couldn't you? Oh, <laughs> and, and not just one of them. Like there, there would have been half a dozen of them. Yeah, all just turned their nose up at me. So eventually, the absolute junior, the trainee, comes out and comes over to me and, oh, is there something that I can help you Low with? Low hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, "This is your lucky day, Tiger." He went, "What do you mean?" I said, "I'm going to buy one of them. Go and get the paperwork ready." And you can see him, he's sort of gone, can I get your brochure on it? No. Nope. Do you want to take it for a drive? No. Go and get the paperwork ready. And he's he's still, you know, you could see him still flustering around and I went, mate, go and get the contract. We're going to sign the contract. It's nearly five o'clock. Let's get it done before you knock off. Easiest sale I reckon that kid's ever had while all <laughs> the stars missed yeah. out on easiest commission they'd have ever made oh reminds me of when i bought my lotus went into went into the dealership i'm like i've waited five years to buy this thing i've just missed out i've, I've gone to three auctions for houses it was in melbourne prices were skyrocketing and i was like that's it if i said if we miss out on this one and they were going for like 80 grand more than what they said the top was top was going to be and i was like fuck this it's gonna like I'm just gonna buy my Lotus. Like I've wanted to <laughs> had this thing next to the phone for five years, getting told to fuck off every time I call. And I'm like, Make that call. <laughs> right? I go in and the and the, I'm walking around it, looking around. My ex husband not yet husband at the time, but he's he's just sitting back and the guy comes over and he's like, Oh, you're buying your uh buying your missus a car, are you? Um, like is she gonna need to test drive it? And <laughs> he just look look <laughs> yes. Dude, she bought me a car for my birthday. You're talking to the wrong person. This is going to go really bad for you. I would go and get somebody else right now. And again, it was, it, it, it was about closing time. And next minute, the owner, Bobby, Bobby Zagami, came in and he's like, I am so sorry. <laughs> he's like, shut the doors. And like, just, I was like, I don't even need it. I'm, I've never test drive one. I never need to test drive one. I'm buying it. It's coming home. And he's like, well, there's a seven week wait on that. And I'm like, shit, that sucks balls. But, <laughs> but 
that that attitude, like the totally off topic for this podcast, but uh, I actually made a, a, one of my very best friends came from that. Um, the the finance guy, uh, Robbie Lesbo, who often watches, yeah, became a great great friend after doing the finance for that, and they looked after us. But like, what's where do you draw the line with those salespeople? What what do you do it's with the them? Boundary, isn't it? You know, it's it's the boundary. Like, you know, for in my case, you know, those those other half dozen guys should have all had their asses kicked. Like, mm -hmm. you know, their their boss should have gone. How did the trainee just pick up that that sale while you guys were what scratching your backsides and you know what were you actually doing? The, yeah, the trainee walked in and and did it in five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's our star. <laughs> yeah, he's the new star. But I think that people, team leaders, get really scared because if it if it is uh, if it's hard to hire. So say right now in in most trades businesses and like either in the allied health professions, the my clients that are mortgage brokers, they're all like screaming for talent. So the thought, and actually, I had a client had to go through this the other day. It's like. Oh, we're so desperate to have this work done, but this particular person is causing a real rub. And I'm like, I've been on one of those team meetings and the rest of the team, the disdain, the disdain. It's like it's you, you it's palpable on a Zoom call. So it's you've got to think about at what cost. So you might think that it's um that you can't afford to be without that person because how are you gonna hire someone else? But I would I would push back and say, how can you afford to not to have all the other people because that one person might make them leave, and if it continues to happen and you permit the behaviour, then you're the one that gets tarred with the behaviour brush, and they they start looking at you because the fish rots from the head down. So like you've got to think, you know, it might be it might you know cause some bleeding right now, but. It's going to be way, way worse if that person is super toxic, what it does to your culture that may not be recoverable, your reputation as a leader, and the domino effect if you don't move them out the door. I can remember making a big mistake. I've made more than one, but I can remember making a big mistake. Um, I, I hired a general manager um, maybe four years ago and um, yeah, came highly, highly recommended, um, had super super lots of experience had sort of been through building or you know rolling businesses and building them and all that sort of stuff so you know was was the ideal fit you know the the yin to the yang was someone that could grind and all that sort of stuff and I can remember his first three months were a bit of a struggle and you know we we needed a bit of work there were yeah you know, things weren't super clear on how to do stuff so he was he he probably needed to work really hard to to get on on top of things and so you know three months in it was just before christmas he sort of said to me oh just don't think i'm getting it you know i'm you know and i can remember at the time i was i was trying to be the good guy i guess and i went look yeah you're working hard just just you know ride it out a bit longer and you know in hindsight because three months later I, he made a big stuff up and I had a pretty big dummy spit and booted him out the door, basically. But I can remember, you know, at the time it was like, ah, oh, just they'll get it, they'll get it, they'll get it. In it's hindsight, just like, you just hope, you're just like praying. It's like, I don't want to have to go through this recruiting process again. And if I don't have them, I have to do the work myself. I can please just yeah. get it. Just get it. So, <laughs> and, and in hindsight, and, and this is, I guess about understanding the person that you've that you've actually enrolled into the business and um, what their skill sets should be based on what they've told you and what they should be able to achieve. Um, for that level of person to be going, I'm not getting it. It should have been a red flag out the door. Don't don't yeah. pass go straight out the door. If you're not getting it now, man, you sorry, you're gone. And that sounds really really hard and. That's the decision I should have made. Three months in, I should have mm. just gone. As soon as, as soon as you're going, I'm wavering. Out you go. Go on. Yeah. Next. Yeah. 
and like hindsight, beautiful, right? But it's it. I know for so many like team leaders and business owners alike, because if it's your team, the responsibility, like when there's extra work to be picked up, you're the one that's got to pick it up. So sometimes you just want a warm body and you just really want to will them into working. So, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. Like seriously, the, the disaster that happened to me in my last business, putting in someone that I had been recommended, had like, should have been, should have been perfect. And I was so focused on family and working, like flying up to the, up to Brisbane and like doing some other stuff that I just did not want to see the flags. Like just, I just didn't want to see it. I just couldn't deal with that right then and there. And I stuck my head in the sand and was like, just found so many ways to justify the behavior. And I wish I would have, hindsight, I wish I would have listened to myself back then because uh, I would t tell clients not to do this. But it's, I was just like, why? Why did I put myself through that pain? Like it, I just could have found another way. Um, what do you think is some of the risk mitigation strategies to in that? Like what do you, what do you wish you did? Like obviously now you can go to that decision, but was there anything that you were deluding yourself with or like you think you think would be good advice to someone else to make sure they don't fall into that trap? I'd, I'd say that's a whole podcast on its own, I reckon, but the short story <laughs> is is being really, really clear on the accountability. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, there, there's... Um, if I deconstruct it, there's probably a thousand things that should have been, <laughs> should have, woulda, coulda. But really, the the key thing is is what's the accountability? Don't think that it's it's um, unfair to hold people to their accountability. Um, mm. You know, if if you're particularly, and and this is a big thing for a lot of small business owners, if you're putting someone into a senior leadership role, you know, they they should 100% be hitting the ground running. You know, there should not really be any lead time and you should be on to them. Um, they should be producing something, not necessarily 100%, but something right mm. from the word go. If they're not, yeah. then they're not, a, they're not a GM, they're not a manager, they're not a, you know, they're not a senior part of your team. Um, obviously, their skills are not exactly what was What was marketed. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, I think that's a really important part. Like they say, uh to hire slow, fire fast. Um, and I like I think we've talked about this before as well. We don't want to fire people without giving them benefit of the doubt or needing to make sure that we've taken extreme ownership over what we could do to upskill them. And there, there could be some uh, gap time in understanding a product range or a service offering or something like that. But the, the, the skills of doing the job or being a leader or like the things that you hot like those uh, underlying behavior traits, not necessarily the your unique company product service offering, like they need to be demonstrating those. And I think that's about, like you said, the accountability and where the ball gets dropped a lot of the time is because we hire because we're busy and we, we kind of cut corners, we maybe don't do our one-week review, we don't do our two-week conversation, we don't do our end-of-month and we haven't scoped out what success looks like for those first four weeks to have a clear measurable, not only for them, but so we don't delude ourselves. Because that's where we don't want to, you know, sometimes I find it's like the avoidance technique. <laughs> uh, like, well, I was too busy to do the meeting. I probably saw the red flags, but I, I didn't have to stare them in the face because I was too busy to do the performance review. And, and you can permit yourself out of the procrastination of looking at it. So I think the, the key thing there is extreme accountability, extreme ownership yes. of where you're at cause. Extreme ownership. Yeah. Jeez. I think that's Jeez. the mic drop that's moment. It. That's the drop. That's the drop, extreme that's ownership. Drop. Leading in, sounds like one of our future ones needs to be the first few weeks. Oh, let's do that because I – created a whole Trello template just recently for onboarding Giddy success up. for the first few for the first few weeks. I'm geeking out right now. I, I don't think I don't get to show it to you. But it literally 
I based it on, I, I documented everything we did bringing on Amy in terms of like the, the videos and what we lead them up for success and then took it to the next level. It's like, what, what, what else could we have done uh, in hindsight to... We, we definitely didn't get it perfect. No. Amy's awesome, but we definitely didn't get it perfect awesome, on her onboarding. No. But now, now I have a process in Trello, which Kay will put into ClickUp for us, that we can actually follow. And it's literally week one, week two, week three, week four, checklist, time, like due dates, assign it to the person who needs to do it. Yeah. All the videos, even in Trello now, you can record a loom straight in Trello to Ooh, add it to nice. the training part. Like it's like, bing. Yeah. Nice. So I'll take extreme ownership. We didn't have it done before Amy started, but we have it now. We have it now. Yeah. I can't drop my mic <laughs> anymore. I can't drop it anymore. <laughs> it's on a swing arm. No. And, <laughs> and I dropped mine, but I only just got it working. So let's No, yeah, do don't that. do that. You only just got it's made it's taken four podcasts to get that thing to work properly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Amazing. as always, I'll uh, I'll say to everyone, if you've got any uh, value out of our conversation today if there or you've got any leaders that you think maybe you should take some value from this conversation today make sure you share this to them if you don't want to publicly shame them you can share it in messenger um, <laughs> um, but drop any comments below we'd love to hear even your horror stories of bad bosses people you should have told to fuck off earlier and any advice you or have customers. for people to or, any people in general <laughs> uh, and any advice that you'd give to others so that they don't fall into the same pitfalls. Amazing. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you next time. Bye. It's not going. <laughs> I wanted to splash us. <laughs>